Hi everybody, this is Doug Mack, and well, of course you know this is Doug Mack, because you're in here almost every day, and you're used to seeing my mug. Anyway, <laughs> anyway it's, it's great to see you. Oh, well, actually, I can't see you, but I, I'm going to act like I can see you. Uh, this is, obviously, I can't be with you today, you know, live and in person, so I thought, you know, the next best thing to help keep the congruency going, help you keep getting the information that you need to be fantastic MAs out there is to not just just throw some materials at you and say you know hey just read your book and all this come on you know we we learn more by getting more of our senses involved you know multi-sensory things so i wanted you to still get the powerpoint that i would that i would show you if i was there you know but but then thanks to our host and be sure and give her a nice round of applause and thank her yes yes you know for what she's taken the time to do for us today and to help us out so uh, i greatly appreciate it but anyway but we want to show the powerpoint and i thought well i'll just record some thoughts and some things to maybe help reinforce the powerpoint as if i were there live you know so i'm i'm just sorry i can't be there you know in person to do it and and you know that i won't be there to you know uh, answer any of your questions and you you won't be seeing me today i Oh, no. No. What are you doing? No. Oh, come on. Now, you didn't have to do that. You miss me, don't you? I mean, don't you just, don't you, don't you really, really miss me? I mean, come on. That, that's not a way to make me feel. <laughs> you know, so anyway, uh, so, yeah, you won't be seeing me today other than what you're seeing here on the wall, you know, right now. But but I wanted to give you the information about about the male reproductive system and give you some information about that so that when our host gives you your study guide today, you know, that you'll feel like you haven't even skipped a beat because everything is just going in order like you're used to getting. And I wanted to make sure that if I wasn't there that, that you would still get the information that you do need. So anyway, uh, this is the male reproductive system. We're just going to go on as if I were just standing up there right now. Uh, this is the male reproductive system. This is anatomy two. So for you folks in anatomy one, no, you're not wasting your time today. You know, because you're here, you're going to get the information. This is your first exposure to the male reproductive system anatomy. And you're going to get the, the study guide with all the wonderful study guide questions that come with it that you can look up in your book, you know, when uh, when the video is over and later today, you know, to kind of give you a jump start, you know, towards this information. And it is Chapter 7 in your El Libro. Uh, that's, you know, that's Lebanese for your book. I'm just kidding. It's Spanish, Doug. Anyway, <laughs> so this is Chapter 7 in your book. So welcome to the male reproductive system in anatomy too. So uh, I thought we'd just go ahead and get started on that. But before we get started on that, I I want to get me a you know drink of my Java here so that I can make sure I can you know, enunciate properly all the terminology words that I need to enunciate. And yes, this is coffee. See coffee. You know I want to make sure that everybody knows this is coffee. You know so that 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 we don't get in any trouble for that. Oh, whoops. Okay, my bad. I forgot. Oops. Yeah, I forgot. Don't tell Mr. Crowley, okay? Don't tell Mr. Crowley that I, that that Doug was drinking coffee in in his room. Hey, wait a minute. This is not the. You're in the classroom. I'm not in the classroom. I'm in my man cave. So since I'm in my man cave, I can drink pretty well what I want to drink, can't I? You know. So <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I'll pull up me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich while I'm at it, huh? I'm just kidding. No, we don't eat in, or drink in the room. Yeah, because you've heard that a million times already from me, so we won't be doing that. Well, anyway, let's just get down to business so that you can go on break here in a little bit and get going. So we are talking about the, the male reproductive system. And some of the things that we kind of want to take away from today is we want to make sure that we're able to list the, the organs of the male reproductive system and give the location, structures, and the functions of each. We'll find out here just a little bit. Uh, that the that the, the primary sex organs for the male is going to be the male testes, you know, and the, that's the gonads for the male, you know, and we want to make sure that we know about those and how important they are, uh, the, the the location structures and functions because you're going to have you're going to have guys coming into clinic 
you and I have male patients coming into clinic with certain kinds of pains, maybe certain kinds of discharges, certain kinds of things that we're going to have to chart that stuff, you know, so when our doctor comes in, she's going to know, or he is going to have to know some of why, they're, what they're presenting with, it's because, come on, you know, they've already they got to see about 43 to 50 other people that day, so it's going to help them do their job better if we do our job better and do proper charting using anatomical reasons and things and causes and whatever of why they're there. So that's going to become very important for us to be able to list those organs and know a little bit about them. Describe how sperm cells are formed. Describe the substances found in semen. Uh, describing uh, the process of erection and ejaculation. We'll find out that, it, that it's very vascular in nature and there could be certain kinds of problems with our male patients if if they have any kind of blood pressure problems or or if they're on certain kinds of medications, you know, the things that, that could actually affect that, you know, or affect certain kinds of, of, of uh, diseases and disorders of the male reproductive system. Now, one of the things we'll, we'll find out is that this chapter is not as long as the female. In other words, when, uh, we're doing our the male reproductive system today, and then you'll get to, uh, uh, we'll complement it, you know, with the female reproductive system. Uh, and I think after this, after we'll do this one today, and then there's a, you'll get another lecture tomorrow, and then we'll jump back into the reproductive system, talk about the other half of the birds and the bees, you know, with the female, uh, you know, the day after tomorrow. Uh, so I guess I should answer one question right up front. Yes, I'm wearing my, my purple sweatshirt. Yes, I'm in my man cave, and I'm wearing my purple sweatshirt. You'll probably see the same purple sweatshirt. <laughs> Yes, I do change clothes and wear deodorant, but you, but you'll probably see you'll probably see me wearing the same clothing setup, uh, you know, the day after tomorrow when you get the female reproductive system. Why you ask? Because I've, I'm pro I'm 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 uh, I'm I'm taping both of these you know, lectures today, so this way you don't think that when you see two days from now when you see the female reproductive system or you see the male, you know, whichever one you do first. You know, that, hey, he's wearing the same clothes. Doesn't the guy take a shower? Well, anyway, you know I do because I'm with you every day. I mean, I always smell good and look good, don't I? For those of you that want A's, say yes. Okay. Anyway, so let's go on. Uh, but I will explain my, my wardrobe so that you wouldn't think, well, why don't he change clothes? Uh, list the actions of testosterone. Now, when we get in the female reproductive system, you'll find out that estrogen and progesterone are the stars of the show when it comes to our female patients. And for guys, it's testosterone. Uh, yeah, you've heard the late night commercials. Well, you know, Jim don't ride horses like he used to, and he might have low T. Well, that's what they're talking about, this, this testosterone. It, and that's our hormone production, like the female estrogen and progesterone. And if the levels aren't there where they need to be, then that's probably why Jim's not riding horses like he used to, or he's not doing a lot of other things like he used to. <laughs> you know. So anyway, so we got to keep in mind that th these hormonal secretions are very important, not just for the female patient, but for the male patients as well. And as we do in every single chapter, see, I'm not skipping a beat. You guys hear this every day, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Describe the causes, signs, and symptoms and treatments of various disorders of and all of us sing together, the male reproductive system. Good job. Well, anyway, so that's what we're talking about today. So we want to make sure that we know about all these different parts and anatomy parts and causes, signs, and symptoms, and diseases and disorders, but, of course, for the male. And now, it really, I mean, I, I like presenting the, the, this information together. I kind of wish we did both the lectures in one day, you know, and did the, both the male and the female, both the birds and the bees in one day. Because there's so many similarities, and although the hormones are different and this kind of thing, there's just so many genetic similarities. You know that that they're that they're almost. I mean, it, it's very it's it's fascinating how how close we are in both the sexes. Uh, the male and the female reproductive systems function together to produce offspring. Duh, that's like that Geico commercial. Well, everybody knows that. You know, the, the female reproductive system nurtures the developing offspring, uh, unless you are a now, you know what? Isn't there some kind? Is it the seahorse? Yes. Yes. Host, did you know that? Did you know that the seahorse actually uh, will carry the baby? Uh, the male the male seahorse carries the babies? I, I didn't know that for the longest time. But anyway, uh, the female reproductive system nurtures developing offspring, unless you're a seahorse. <laughs> and um, yes, this really is coffee. This really is coffee I'm, I'm drinking, see? And, and that the... And that 
both produce important hormones. So in other words, the progesterone and progesterone, I mean, you know, the estrogen and progesterone for the female and, of course, testosterone for the guys. So without that hormone production, you know, our, our bodies are going to be out of sync and not do the things that they're designed to do. So that's going to become important for us. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of the hour that, or not the hour, but when I started the PowerPoint, that's what I'm used to saying when I'm there with you, isn't it? That the testes are the primary sex organs for the guy, for the male. They are the primary sex organs, as the ovaries are to the female reproductive system. And, of course, the male testes develop in the abdominal pelvic cavity of the fetus. Uh, you moms that have had baby boys know that sometimes they don't descend immediately. You know, so it, it, they, it takes time for them to descend into the scrotal sac uh, shortly or after birth. You know, it, it might take a little while, you know, but that's usually what, what we'll find. And it produces the male sex cells or the sperm and produces the male hormone testosterone, uh, the star of the show. And then look on the right, you see some more of the accessory uh, features of the male reproductive system, like the scrotum, which is basically the sac that holds the testes. Know that they are free-floating. Now, there's going to be some seminal vesicles, you know, that, that come down, you know, from, uh, that, that come down to the, the testes, into the scrotum, but, 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 but the testes actually fr uh, flow freely. That's hard to say. But thank goodness I'm drinking the coffee so that I can, I can enunciate this. <laughs> but anyway, so when you get into clinic, what you'll find, uh, that when I was in clinic, I found this out real quickly, you know, that, that, the, that when the male patient, you know, presents for a physical, the, either the female doctor or the male doctor know how to palpate, you know, or, or, or hold those testes so that they can palpate for any kind of lesions, any kind of soreness, tenderness, any kind of lumps. Yep, there could be lumps on the male testes too. You know, so the, we, we're wanting to palpate for any, 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 uh, any abnormalities you know, that we might need to be tested in all seriousness. But we have those seminiferous tubules that are on top of the testes, you know, that, that will come down to them. And that, that's what are filled with spermatogenic cells that actually produce the sperm. You know, and then we have what's called interstitial cells, you know, that produce the testosterone. Uh, the sperm cells themselves, uh, it, uh, each, each of the sperm cells has a head. Uh, which has a nucleus with 23 chromosomes. Well, you're probably asking, well, Doug, why are we worried about the number 23? That's because if there's an irregularity in the number of chromosomes in that sperm cell, there could be a problem, you know, with either infertility, there could be a problem with uh, with uh, deformation of maybe of, of the birth child, you know. And so there could be, if there's a problem with the chromosomes, there may not be the DNA structure there, you know, for a healthy child. Uh, the, the acrosome is an enzyme-filled sac that helps the sperm penetrate that ovum. So if that one sperm is the one the lucky sperm out of all the millions and th hundreds of thousands, you know, that are competing to swim upstream like a salmon, that's usually, it, it, the, the acrosome is, is going to be the power plant or the energy you know, that will propel that, uh, that penetration and to, 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 uh, to go into that ovum and, and create that pregnancy. There's something called the midpiece. And if you see the word mitochondria here, the mitochondria is to the sperm cells what public service company or PSO is or General Electric is to the electric company. It provides that power. In other words, that mitochondria is a power. It's kind of like if you were thinking if we were in the cardiovascular system, you, we would liken that to to like the you know the the, the AV node you know the, you know the, the natural pacemaker of the heart that that shock gives those electrical signals you know or electrical impulses you know that will that will that will make the that make the muscle uh, move and contract and and dilate and all that so the mitochondria is important in that because it generates the cells energy and of course the end of the sperm cell is basically a tail just like a fish that's it's a flagellum that propels that sperm forward. So that becomes important in, in the overall anatomy of that of that cell. The male internal accessory organs. Now you notice it says accessory organs. The primary was what? Okay, yes, that's right. The testes. For you, that for you, those of you that thought that, you're right. <laughs> I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to hear you, but I know that you were thinking that because we just covered it on our slide. So good job on that. Anyway, so some of the accessory organs are the epididymis, which sits on top of each of the testes that receives those spermatids from the seminiferous tubulas, you know, that, that come down to the testes. 
and then of course as, as they fill with the spermatids that, that become the sperm cells. The vast difference when the guy goes in and says, "Okay, wait, I, we don't want any more kids," you know, I want to, I want to, to get a vasectomy, make sure that 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 I don't have any more, or try to make sure. You know, it's not one hundred percent effective, right? The vast difference is the tube connected to the epididymis that carries that sperm. We're going to snip it, and we're going to break up that mechanical process of that of that fluid that that would that would flow. So we're going to snip the vast difference and and uh, to hopefully create a situation where it won't flow. Now you probably all heard situations where sometimes they grow back, and sometimes it happens, you know. And so it's not. I mean, I like to say it's 100 percent, but it's really not 100 percent. Then we got the seminal vesicle, which it secretes a fluid rich in sugar used to make energy. Uh, prostaglandins stimulate the muscular contractions in the female to propel the sperm forward. So see, it, 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 it's a combination of both the birds and the bees. You get, you've, got, you've got the seminal vesicles that are secreting you know, the prostaglandins, but that's going to, con to create muscular contractions in the female. You know, so, it, so the female cooperates with those with that, with the prostaglandins to create that sperm to go the direction that it needs to go, and then the seminal fluid uh, is released into the vas deferens just before ejaculation, and that's about sixty percent of the semen volume is that seminal fluid itself. Now, if we look on to the next slide, we see the prostate gland, or we don't see it, but we we're reading about it. The prostate gland is probably something that you really need to be familiar with because as your career grows in medical you'll find out that certain guys, as they get older, are going to have an increase in the size of the prostate gland. That is not that is not the kiss of death, you know, and that's not instant cancer. It is normal for, a, for the male prostate gland to enlarge. Now, sometimes they enlarge too much, and if they do, uh, there's surgery to go in and trim them, you know, and bring them back down to size. You know, but as long as, as they just, as long as they is they gradually increase in size. That usually is not usually not a problem uh, until it gets to the point where it's painful, or maybe it gets to a point where you might have a male patient presenting with the fact that they get up all times during the night, and and when they try to micturate, or you know, as you guys know from your analysis, that's urination. You know, when they try to micturate, if 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 they have maybe trouble with urination, or if there's pain with it, or if there's discharges or bleeding from it, then we've got issues we got to look at. But if that prostate gets so large, it could it, well it it surrounds the urethra. Well, what's going to happen if you know if you if you're holding a a, a small balloon and then you, you you try to you know wrap around it with your hands, it's it's going to constrict it. And if that prostate's constricted, it's not going to function as it should and release as it should. And so that's why we have problems with some of our older patients, for, you know, our male patients, for that reason. Now, the prostate gland actually produces and secretes a milky alkaline fluid into the urethra just before ejaculation. And for those of you that have gone through the lectures where we've talked about acidity and alkalinity, that becomes an issue, can it not? Because of the fact that you you're, remember in our state of homeostasis, where we've our body's got to be on one hand have a certain level of alkalinity and a certain level of, of acidity, and it all works well if everything's equal. But if one gets out of whack, then we've got problems. And so, but so that alkaline fluid works within the birds and the bees to make sure that that the the uh, the acidic environment is not greater than the alkaline environment, you know, in the vagina. So that the sperm will, will will stay viable and live and and move forward, you know. So that becomes important for us, you know, to make sure that the that, that there's enough alkalinity there in the prostate gland as well. The fluid protects sperm in the acidic environment of the vagina, and that's the forty percent of of semen itself. There's something called the Cowper's glands, and I know it, it says buberethral. You know, but you'll hear hear it referred to more as the Cowper's glands. You know, should you go on in medicine, it produces a, mu a mucus-like fluid secreted just before ejaculation, and it lubricates the end of the penis to allow for that lubrication or for easier movement. You know, and acceptance. You know, by the vagina. You know, so that it, it all plays that 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 the the bigger the larger role, and then the semen uh, is al is an alkaline mixture. Uh, it's got nutrients, prostaglandins in it. And there's a 1.5 to 5.0 milliliter per ejaculate on average. 
if if a patient presents it and says that they're they're not ejaculating enough or they barely ejaculate at all, they could be sent to an infertility you know clinic to have it measured you know and have it tested to see if there could be a problem maybe with that or look at the very next subheading the sperm count of 40 to 250 million per milliliter you know just in case you know if the female's not getting pregnant and they've tried for months or years or whatever you know there could be a problem with that number of the sperm count or the amount of the ejaculate in the in the semen now continue talking as we continue talking about the external accessory organs the scrotum holds the testes away from the body. Now this is what I think is fascinating. You know how you know we all know of our body temperature being 98.6 on average. I mean come on not everybody's 98.6. But what we're going to here is look at this point, subpoint, a temperature one degree below the body temperature. In other words, we don't want the testes to lie directly against the human body that's 98.6. You know what would happen? It'd kill the sperm cells and then they wouldn't be viable when they went into the vagina and the and the female would not get pregnant it isn't it amazing how isn't it amazing how one degree can make that much difference it can make that much difference in the male testes it can make that much difference in the freezing of water from 32 degrees to 33 degrees one degree one degree is very powerful guys and you know what not to, not to get off the lecture or everything but you know what if you do one degree more work in this room one degree more work in all the rest of your classes here, you know how much better of an MA you could be? You know how much more money you can make as your career grows? But just by doing one degree more, we can do one degree more. But anyway, let's get back to what we're talking about today. So lined with serous membrane that secretes the fluid. So the scrotum has a big responsibility not just to hold the testes, not to, to be able to maintain that body temperature of that one degree, but it also lines the serous membrane that secretes the fluid. And the testes move freely like we were talking about before. And so that when the when the doctor palpates them, you know, she'll be able to know if there's like a lesion or or if there's some kind of tumor or something, you know, that might need to be looked at further. And then the penis, uh, it, it's a shaft of erectile tissues that that's going to surround that urethra that has a couple of purposes, you know, to deliver sperm and to ur and for urination. But then there's the glance penis, which is the cone shaped structure on that end of the penis. And something called the prepuce, which is the skin covering the glands penis, you know, in uncircumcised males. And, of course, it delivers the sperm and, and is responsible for urination. Erection, orgasm, and ejaculation. Erection, the parasympathetic nervous system stimulates the erectile tissue. So there's, there's, a, there's a mental thing. There's a nervous system thing going on. And then that sends an email or a, a stimulus down to, to the penis, and it becomes engorged with blood that creates that erectile tissue. And then there's an orgasm. The sperm cells are propelled out of the testes into the urethra, and the secretions from the accessory organs are also released into that urethra. And then ejaculation. The semen's forced out of the urethra, and then those sympathetic nerves from within our nervous system then stimulate that erectile tissue to release the blood. And then, it re and then the penis will return back to a flaccid state. And yeah, there's actually been, if you've probably seen it on TV, have you ever seen the commercials on TV, you know, for, you know, some of the, you know, the, the medications that, that, that can help, you know, ED, like erectile dysfunction, you know, and of course, you know, that you always hear in the commercial, you know, that in some, in some situations, if, you know, if, uh, you know, if it let, you know, if, if the erection lasts longer than four hours, always see your physician. Well, I, I bet so. You know, so but the, but the point is, is that it is a it's a nerve and mechanical related system, and that erectile tissue is 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 supposed to to release the, the that blood, but there could be situations where it won't. And guess what? And all jokes aside, this could be painful for your male patient, and so keep that in mind that in clinic you may you may be you may be encountering that you know from some of your male patients that come in. And now I mentioned the fact that it's a, there's a lot of mental going on. You know, the male reproductive hormones in the hypothalamus of our brain, you know, we've got something called a gonadotrophin-releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary of the brain to, to release these hormones. And then, but we said the star of the show, and it really is, testosterone, look at the bottom of your, of your PowerPoint here, which is the secondary sex characteristic. You know, so the, the, the testosterone is a secondary sex characteristic. It's the maturation of the male reproductive organs, and it's related, regulated by negative feedback. Now, the negative feedback, uh, when you get 
the if you've already gotten the female reproductive lecture, uh, we talked about the mammary glands working with the positive and negative feedback loops, meaning you know like in the in the female the mammary glands will continue to secrete milk as long as the infant continues to suckle, you know and the, but then it stops when that stimuli stops. Well, in, in testosterone, it's related, regulated by negative feedback. There doesn't have to be a stimulus because it's already going on in the hypothalamus of the brain, and it's not something that we can flip a light switch on and change our testosterone. There doesn't have to be a stimulus. The body just knows it, what to do. And, and that's how, uh, you know, so a guy is not uh, mentally responsible for his, his, his low T, his low testosterone. Because it, it's 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 because it's a negative feedback loop. It, it's a body generated thing, as opposed to a positive feedback loop where where the suckling on on the mammary glands of the female breast can can create milk, you know, in a in a female uh, patient. So uh, that could would be the differences between these two. Now, uh, as with all of our body systems that we talk about, you know, there's different kinds of diseases and disorders of the male reproductive system. Uh, there's BPH, uh, or benign prostatic hypertrophy, which is a non-malignant enlargement of the prostate gland. So uh, older guys might come in, and they might be worried, oh, man, I got prostate cancer. It, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be cancer because the prostate gland can enlarge, and it's, and it's not malignant, you know, but it can enlarge, and that's what we basically call BPH. Then there's epididymis, which is the infl inflammation of that epididymis. usually starts as a UTI. Guess what? Yes, guys can get UTIs too, urinary tract infections. Absolutely. You know, so guys can get it as well. And then uh, impotence or erectile, or we call it ED, erectile dysfunction, a disorder in which the erection cannot be achieved or maintained. And about 50% of guys between age 40 and 70 have some degree of it. And in most of a guy's life, they may not even know they have it. I mean, it may not be that visible or that much of a problem for them. You know, but it, but if it's diagnosed, it's usually between ages 40 and 70. You know, but but again, a lot a lot of men either feel it coming on, or not feel it coming on, but but can but maybe they don't have sex as much as they used to, and they, and, it, and they don't recognize it, and therefore when they go into clinic now or with a problem, they don't recognize it until they go into clinic maybe with a problem. But then the doctor sometimes she or he will ask, you know, well, how's your sex life going? You know, or in is everything normal, whatever. And then sometimes these instances and these statistics can come out, you know, at, at that point. And let's see, we've got prostate cancer, probably the most common form of cancer in guys over age 40. Now, we're, you're about to read something here that, 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 that might surprise you a little bit. And, of course, prostitis is inflammation of the prostate gland. But look at that last one, testicular cancer. Look at the age group there where it's most common in, age 15 to 30 age 15 to 30. You would think that would just be in older guys as well. Nope. Uh, sadly, in clinic, uh, now I worked in internal medicine. I, I was an MA in internal medicine, uh, you know, for a couple doctors. And, and usually in internal medicine, uh, it's just usually it's, it's people age 21 or, or older, you know. But, uh, but I actually heard of situations where there were 17-year-old guys coming in uh, that suffered testicular cancer. You know, so it's, it's, that could be very serious. You know, but it, it can hit as young as 15. I know it'd be hard to believe, but, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very gr aggressive malignancy. Now, right above that, prostest, uh, prostatitis. Uh, in, in medical terminology, you guys have already gone through some of the seven menology with me. And you notice I'm a host. You know, when I say seven menology, these guys don't know what I mean. You know, but it means, you know, the, I, I talk for seven minutes each day. You know, they'll, they'll tell you. I talk uh, seven minutes each day about medical terminology. We break down suffixes and prefixes and root words and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, for those guys that have already had the, the, inf uh, the inflammation, you know that that's where your itis is. See that suffix there for prostatitis? So you've got a suffix. I mean, you've got a uh, inflammation of the prostate there. And that's what your prostatitis is. So anyway, uh, so those are some of the diseases and disorders of the male reproductive system. Now, uh, you will go through this again uh, when we see the female reproductive lecture. You know, but if you'll notice that our slide here breaks down into male and female related causes of infertility. Now, more than likely, you know, when your male patient comes to the primary care physician, uh, he'll say all these different kinds of problems or whatever, but then more than likely, he'll be referred to 
to uh, maybe to a, a urologist, you know, that'll do some testing, you know, to find out if there's some problems here with, you know, with the impotence and the, you know, the retrograde ejaculation and low sperm count and medic and certain kinds of medications and drugs can call it uh, cause those problems, you know, in in uh, male infertility. And of course, we'll go through the the female ones, you know, when you go through the female lecture. But these are just some of the of the uh, instances where you're going to find uh, infertility problems presenting into your clinic, you know, where you're working. And these are some of the causes. And of course, with causes, there's tests that we can use for them. If you look down the left-hand side, you know, with certain kinds of semen analysis and endometrial biopsies and urine analysis and all kinds of things, you know, that we can do. Uh, but more than likely, what you're seeing here is probably going to be done by the urologist. Now, there's a few here, you know, that, that your primary care physician you know, that you're working with might work with. But if you work for a urologist, you'll probably see most of these. And uh, and then on the right side, the treatments for them. You know, there's certain kinds of treatments that can be advised and as options for the male patient in regards to these. So uh, be familiar with them. They're in your, and if you don't get them, uh, now you'll, when you go down the hall and you get your lab lecture out of the way, in lab lecture, you'll, you'll go over every one of them, believe me. You'll go through every one of them and be tested on them. You know, but here we're more concerned with really the anatomy or the anatomical reasons for things is what we're talking about today. And sexually transmitted, and you notice it says diseases, and we'll talk about this again when we get into the female reproduction, that it's no longer called sexually transmitted diseases. Well, let's upgrade our thinking, upgrade our upgrade our medical terminology. It's now sexually transmitted infections. We now have sexually transmitted infections, not diseases. So uh, so please start using the word infections instead of diseases here when you're talking ST, what used to be STDs. Uh, uh, AIDS is, is considered a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, chlamydia uh, caused by bacterium, most commonly uh, reported. Uh, often there's no symptoms in a female. So uh, be, be, and, and yes, guys will present with certain kind of problems where they've actually picked up a, a sexually transmitted infection, you know, from the female. As we hear the stories of the females picking up, you know, certain kinds of gonorrhea or genital warts or whatever from the guys. You know, so uh, sometimes these are just handed back and forth. You know, but genital warts caused by HPV, not everyone infected has symptoms. That's scary because you can be infected with it, not know you have it uh, until then, and then, uh, but it can be passed on to maybe a partner. So that's, that's an issue. Gonorrhea is a bacterial cause. Uh, the only good thing about that is that, you know, there's pills for bacteria and there's things that we can do to kill it. But when it gets into the viral or virus, you know, then we've got challenges, you know, but gonorrhea, a uh, very real problem, you know, with the male patients that could be presenting in the clinic, as well as herpes simplex. Uh, pubic lice, syphilis, uh, trichomoniasis. Uh, again, several of these can be transmitted to, you know, to the uh, uh, to the female uh, or from the female to the male. But what's really sad? Look at the first one uh, right up here. I think I, I think I can maybe I can get my yellow thing to go around this. Uh, the uh, herpes simplex caused by viruses causes cold sores, known as genital herpes, may be passed from mother to child during childbirth. That, that breaks my heart, but yeah, you actually see that. Uh, guys, that's pretty well it for the male reproductive system. You'll find out that the female reproductive system is going to be a little bit longer uh, because it's more got a few more working parts, and then we're and the female will be talking, you know, the you know the uh, uh, you know the birthing of a child and the carrying of the child and and that process and the fetal periods and all this uh, because because uh, in our species, guys aren't seahorses. Yep, and as you guys know, the seahorses, you know, carry the uh, carry the uh, babies. You know, uh, male male seahorses carry the babies in seahorse hood. I don't think there's seahorse hood, seahorse species, whatever. <laughs> anyway, seahorses. I'm glad I'm not a seahorse. Anyway, so in summary, the organs of the male reproductive system include the testes. Remember, those are the primary sex organs of the guy responsible for sperm and hormone production and the accessory organs of the vas deferens, seminal vesicles, prostate, and buberethral glands that have that secretion you know, for lubrication, scrotum, and the penis. Then you got spermatogenesis that, that begins, that creates the fluid by which it's going to go uh, into the process. We talked about semen. 
uh, how it can be tested, uh, erection, how vascular erection is, and there could be problems with it, and testosterone being the the um, uh, the uh, the primary hormone for for male. You know, so if a guy presents into your clinic with all certain kinds of problems, then that it could be related to that. The diseases of the male reproductive system vary widely. There could be different kinds of, of just, it could be something as simple as an inflammation and to up to a stage three or higher cancer. Uh, so that's, that's, those are, these are just some of the labels that, that we, that we talk about when we talk about the male reproductive system. Uh, what I encourage you to do and host, uh, don't let them tell you otherwise, because they'll try. I'm just kidding. I, I like these. I love these guys. But anyway, uh, p- please, guys, work on your gold boxes. Uh, don't let our host have to, to say to do it. You know to do it. So please work on your gold boxes to, to bring out the most important parts of this lecture. And, 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 and of course, our host will probably be giving you a, a, a pass out a study guide when, when, if they're copied. You know, and, and host, I, I tried to get these copied before I left. So anyway... Uh, so work on your gold boxes today and, and work on your study guide questions today and host that's what they that's what they can do. I mean they and, and hey also guys don't forget about your, your don't forget about the index cards. You can work on your index cards even though I'm not there to do your seven monology, you know you know what column to go down. go down your element column you know and pick out some prefixes and suffixes for that uh, for those to put on your cards. so, so host they could be working on their cards. Of their index cards, they could be working on their gold boxes. They can be working on getting the answers to the study guide questions. I mean, so there's so many things. There's there's so many things that they can be doing, you know. So, but we wanted to take this hour though and get some lecture information out to you. I guess that's about going to do it. Any questions? Raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I won't be able to hear him, will I? All right. Well, all right. Uh, Doug Max going to go back to drinking his one of his favorite beverages, the, the coffee. Well, oh, again, don't go telling Mr. Crowley the. That, that that Mr. Max drinking in his room. I'm in my man cave, so I can drink what I want. So anyway, uh, it's been fun, and thank you again, host, for covering class today. And and guys, I miss you. Uh, and it'll be great uh, seeing you when I get back. Uh, but stay tuned for some more of the lectures uh, this week while I'm gone. Uh, and uh, and have fun with it. And um, and and be sure and do your stuff. And uh, and I'll and I'll I'll see you when I get back. This is Doug Mack. It's been fun. See you soon.